for inviting me to this temple and speak to all of you on this very auspicious occasion. Let me also express my sincere greetings to all of you for 169th anniversary of Indian arrival. This is not the Indian arrival alone, but it is also the arrival of Indian culture and Indian values, including the values of Vedic knowledge and Bhagavad Gita and, of course, Srimad Bhagavatam. So all of you came here, you brought this knowledge to this country far away from India. So that is also one of the great contributions you made. Now today I was told I will speak something on Bhagavad Gita. So I will take a few uh, slokas. My Sanskrit is not that good, but I will understand a little bit. And uh, I will try to expound on them to explain who we are. My theme will be who am I to discover one's own self. Because that is one of the very fundamental uh, principles of spirituality. They call it Adhyatma. Adhyatma means study of the self, to understand the self. Because we, as human beings, each one of us, each a prototype of the entire universe. You represent the entire universe. So if you can understand your own self, I think you understand the universe much better. So I take uh, the first sloka which I take is it's a combination. I'm not going to go slow by slow. Uh, it is on the uh, 43rd in chapter 3. 42nd, 42nd. That is, this sloka explains the constitution of the human being. Indriyani paranyahu paranyarindu me param manah manastu para buddhiryo buddhiri parastu pusay The similar slokas have come in Kathopnisar and yeah, Kathopnisar. That is 3.1.10 and 2.3.7. The slight difference because the, the Kathopnisar sloka also refer to, to to the ground, the, the, the Almighty. Then the sloka is concerning the soul, which I think you know very well. Vansasi jiranani yatha vihai, navani grahati naro prani, tatha sarirani vihai jiranani anyati sanyati navani dehi. And then, nain chitanti shastrani nain tahati paukai. So I will be basically confining myself to these slokas in explaining who we are. Now, if you ask me, and I say, my, what is this? So you will say, this is my hand. If somebody asks me, what is this? I will say, this is my shirt. Somebody asks me, this is what? What is this? is my watch. So, if somebody asks me, what is this? So I say, this is my body. Somebody says, what is this? This is your face. So the answer is that it is a possessive pronoun. This is my hand. This is my body. This is my face. So what is the difference between my watch and my face? And actually there is no difference. Because you possess the watch, you also possess the body. You are not body. There is somebody else who owns this body. And that is why you call it my body. A possessive pronoun you use. You use the same possessive pronoun for your shirt. So we will discover who is the owner of this body. How we reach there. And this slokas from Bhagavad Gita and Kathopnisar, they are very lucid in detail to explain what it was. So let's understand what the human being is. 
I call it a human constitution. I don't call it human body or human being as such because it has various layers. And I want to explain those layers to you in little detail. The first and the most visible part of the human constitution is the human body. You see this body? It's the largest part of the human constitution. It's the most miraculous machine ever created in this universe. As I keep telling that this is the only machine which can convert inanimate into animate. You eat bread and you drink juice and you drink water, it becomes flesh and blood, blood and neurons in your body and it becomes alive. It becomes intelligent. You touch it and you feel what it is. You think, this is what this body is. There's only one part of the body. This is, if you go into the details of the human anatomy, it is the most miraculous uh, system ever created by anybody. We have this live, beautiful body, if you touch here, you feel it. And what about these inanimate hair? They come out of this body. You can cut them, nothing happens. The, the, out of the animate body, inanimate comes out. The inanimate food you eat, it becomes animate inside the body. When the body needs energy, it makes you feel hungry. When it needs rest, it makes you feel sleepy. When it needs to discard the waste, it tells you that you need to go to the toilet. You see, it is a very intelligent system. We can't imagine how intelligent it is. So the body is the, most, the, is the first layer and most visible part of the human constitution. But the body is not as powerful as we think it is. In fact, it is the least powerful part of the human constitution. Least. It's underlined, least powerful. Because this big body is controlled by your senses. Senses are pare. The body is pare senses. Senses are higher than the body. Because if somebody cannot see, cannot hear properly, cannot speak, cannot um, see or cannot smell, cannot taste, what is his body? His body is more like a vegetable. In the old days when our senses become weak and we cannot uh, you know, grasp things through our senses, what happens? This is what happens. So the big body is actually controlled by your senses, which are very small. The five senses of action and five senses of perception, they control your body. The big body. But senses are not as powerful as we think they are as well. You see, senses are controlled by your mind. Man, man is parer. Senses, it's higher than senses. Because you all have five senses right now. You have ears, you have eyes, you have a smell, you can touch, you can taste, everything there. But even you will not listen to me if your mind is not with me. If your mind is with your child, if your mind is in the kitchen, if your mind is at home, you will not listen to me what I am saying. Your ear is right here. So ear doesn't listen. It's the mind which listens. The mind controls your ear, the mind controls your eyes, the mind controls your taste, the mind controls your touch. So you listen from mind, you see from mind. So the mind is even higher than your sense organs. Sense organs control your body and mind controls your sense organs. Everything which you perceive with your senses, it is done in combination with mind and senses. But mind is a very volatile instrument. You see, it's, a, it's the most volatile thing you can imagine in this universe. It is the fastest traveling thing. It can go to New York in a fraction of a second, to Calcutta in another fraction, to Moon third fraction, and anywhere it can go, it's the fastest traveling. There's no instrument which can travel faster than mind. This is the only instrument which can travel back in time. Nothing else can travel back in time except your mind. Sitting here, you can go back to your childhood. Right here, sitting here. You can go back to your, you know, events when you were uh, five years old, you were going to the school, you can remember those days. It's the only instrument which can travel. But the mind is very volatile. Mind is like waves in the ocean. You know the waves never stop in the ocean. Sometimes they are higher, sometimes lower. Mind also has this continuous waves. Your mind is all the time flowing with ideas and 
ideas. There's not even a single second when your mind is not flowing with waves. So it's not easy to control the mind. And there's a lot of, we talk about meditation, we talk about keeping the mind still. There's a big, big uh, writing on how to control the mind, how to just uh, regulate the mind in Indian writings. Because the mind is the one which can make you happy in a fraction of a second, it can make you cry in a fraction of a second, it can make you highly emotional in a fraction of a second. It, it, it rules you. It rules you most of the time. You are carried away by mind. So mind being such a uh, powerful instrument, it needs to be controlled as well. How to do that? So there's another layer in the human constitution which is called Bhutti, intellect, which is higher than mind. Intellect tries to control, not always succeeds, but tries to control the mind, tries to regulate. It's telling you that this is not right thing to do, this is not moral thing to do, this is not legal thing to do. You know, in this circumstances, this you should not be doing. So there's constant interaction between your mind and intellect. You realize every every moment of your life you have this interaction. Even when you are coming here, you say, What should I wear? Your intellect will tell you this is the right clothing to wear. When you go back uh, home, you say, How do I greet somebody who is sitting in a house? You know, intellect keeps telling you what to do, what not to do. So it tries to regulate the mind. Mind is, uh, you know, very volatile. It goes here and there, but intellect tries to keep it in check. So this is another layer of the human constitution. And even beyond this is a layer called ego. Now ego ahem, in Sanskrit it's called ahem. Ahem is the one which makes you feel that I am something. You know when you have a common thing and you want to divide it, you have to create division. So the goat when wanted to create this universe out of the universal consciousness, he had to create ego. Ahem was created that time. It was added to the Mahatat. Mahatattva is the first and prime material of creation of this universe. So the Ahem was added to Mahatattva. And that's how this, uh, the whole concept of mind and yoga was yours. Otherwise everything was same, there's no difference. So the mind and yours, that concept came in. And ego is a very, very delicate part of the human constitution. You know, ego is one, when I come here and somebody doesn't receive me properly, I make it hurt. If the president of the country comes and is not received, he gets hurt. A rich guy comes and he's not given proper attention, he gets hurt. Even your spouse can get hurt, your child can get hurt. And a relationship of 20 years can be demolished within a few seconds. If you don't even, uh, sometimes you don't say good morning to somebody and he feels hurt. This is a great problem of ego and actually ego is a, a thing which grows with, uh, you know, if you become more knowledgeable, the ego grows. If you become richer, the ego grows. If you become more powerful, the ego grows. In fact, the powerful people, the rich people, the, the so-called professors, they have higher ego than the normal human being. It, it is the way it, it conducts itself. So these are the five physical layers of the human constitution. Physical layers. The body, the senses, the mind, the intellect, and the ego. Why physical? Mind you cannot see, cannot touch. And the intellect you cannot see, you cannot touch. Ego you can, why it is physical? I'll explain that a little later. Now I was talking about this body is mine, the participant. Who, who is the owner? So what is this? Who keeps this? How do you see? How do you walk? How do you talk? What is this power inside which makes you alive, which makes you intelligent? Now this power we have to think about. That is the power we call it consciousness, we call it Atma, we can call it soul, whatever name you give. It, it doesn't matter, but there is some power which keeps us alive, which gives how a small particle of semen becomes a fetus, how it grows, because that consciousness is injected at the time of conception into the, into the body. And when that consciousness leaves us at the time of death, 
all this thing disappears, the body disappears, the senses disappear, the mind disappears, the intellect disappears, the ego disappears. All they disappear. They don't exist anymore. So that everything is governed by this consciousness. Now some people say that they don't believe in this consciousness. They believe in what they call it's some sort of chemical combination in the brain which brings this consciousness and then that combination goes away, it disappears. There is a there are many scientists who believe in that kind of theory. Now I want to give an example to explain how you experience consciousness every single day in your life. But you do not recognize it because we don't give attention, we take things for granted. This is an example which happens with each one of us every single day. Now after this you will go back home, you will take your dinner and you will sleep. You will go into the dreamland, you will start dreaming. What happens in that time? Your body is not there. Your senses are not there. They are taking rest, they are sleeping. This world disappears, this whole world disappears, you see. It is demolished, it no longer exists. And what happens? You create a new world. Look at the power you are doing it. You create a new world. In that world you exist in the form of rain, in the form of light. Your body doesn't exist. Physical body doesn't exist. Your senses don't exist, but you exist in the form of light there. And you do everything which you are doing here. In that dream you pray, you go to temple, you eat your food, you fight with your you know, friends, you, you do, you argue, you do everything what you are doing in this world. But this world is demolished. A new world is created. Look at the power. Power of that consciousness inside you. That is called Tejas state of the soul. In Sanskrit they call it Tejas. Tejas means light, the state which gives you light. This is called waking state of soul. This is called Vesnava state in, in Sanskrit. This is the state where you can feel physically the existence of the physical world. You can touch, you can see, you can hear. In that state, you don't see any physical thing. You see everything in the form of light. So that is the power of consciousness. Then you go into a deep sleep after that. Nothing exists. The whole world you created also disappears after that. It's demolished. This world doesn't exist. You don't exist. Nothing exists in that state. There is a pure consciousness state. That is called Pragyavastha. Pragya is the true state of the consciousness. And that state exists because you are still alive. When you get up, you say, oh, I had a great sleep. How do you know you had a great sleep? You didn't exist that time at all. Nothing existed. But you, you get up and you say, yes, I had a great sleep. So, you see these things happening to you every single day of life. What is this? How it happens? Because there is something inside you which has made it happen. And that inside you is called consciousness. That consciousness when it leaves your body, you are dead. Because your body is made of the five elements of creation. We call them Anshtattva and Sanskrit. The body goes back to those five elements. And then Nothing remains because that is the only thing which remains in the body. And that is why we say this is my body. We don't say this is me. We say my body because the owner of the body is some, somebody else sitting inside you. And that is what this sloka, uh, uh, third chapter, 42nd sloka of Bhagavad Gita explains all this in very, very uh, few words but in a great, uh, you know, what you call performance. Then we talk about the, the two words in Sanskrit called Sat and Asat. Sat means the existence which is eternal, which always exists. It is not subject to change. And Asat means the existence which is there but it changes continuously. It is subject to change, it is not eternal. But it is there. It exists. Now, in order to understand the, the meaning of soul, we must understand that these two words. And I was telling you why mind and ego, which are not visible, they are still visible. Now, there is a very simple distinction between self and self. 
The distinction is that anything in this universe which is subject to the vagaries of time, which changes with time, either depreciates or appreciates or changes with time, is a sat. And everything which is physical changes with time. Your mind, when you are a child, it grows. It grows, it reaches a point and then it starts decaying after a point. And when you are dead, the mind is gone. So it is subject to decay, subject to change. Even the mother earth on which we are sitting is subject to decay. One day it will disappear. Even the sun will disappear one day. The solar system will disappear one day. Because they are all subject to change. All the entire physical universe which you see is subject to change. And therefore it is called Asat. It is also in, in Upanishadic language, they call it to understand this is called Avidya. To understand this Asat, and its pages, it's important to understand this. Then only you can understand the Sat. And that is called Avidya. And then there's another word called Vidya, which is to understand the Sat, the eternal, which always exists. Now what is that which always exists? That is the consciousness. That the soul, the universal soul and the individual soul, which is not subject to change, which remains constant all the time which is eternal. That's why Lord Krishna said that it, the, the fire cannot destroy it, the wind cannot dry it, the water cannot make it, make it wet, the arms cannot destroy it. And he said that as you change your clothes, when their clothes become dirty and old, you throw them away, the soul takes a new body when the body becomes useless. And how do you know that you have grown? How do you know that? It's like I'm, I feel that I was young 30 years ago, now I'm growing. How do you feel that? Why? Why do you feel it? You cannot measure it unless there is something, you know, static. Like a river you measure, you need a standard a scale to measure the river. To measure the water of the depth of the river, you have a scale. Okay, today is 10 feet, tomorrow is 12 feet, you can measure it. You can measure the speed of a car, how is fast it is running, depending because the, the distance is static and the car is running. So there has to be something static and something running, then only you can measure. How do you measure your body that you become old? Because there is something static in the body and that static thing is called consciousness of soul. That is sat. That is eternal, and that is what Lord Krishna explained. So I think I'll stop here, just to give you an explanation of who we are. So we are not a body, we are a soul. We are eternal, we existed, we exist and we will exist forever. What happens is that the body goes away, the body dies with time, it is subject to decay, and body is changed like we change our clothes, but the, the, the consciousness exists. And this is proved to us every single day that we can exist in the form of light because we do exist in our dream state in the form of light. So we can exist with our bodies and with our physical senses. This is proved to each one of us every day. So there's no question, uh, there's no, no reason to question that existence at all. So we exist after our death in the form of light. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you.